This is Duke University. Hi and welcome to our first installment of Office Hours today with Professor Charlie Dunlap of the Duke Law School. Ethan, thank you very much. I think this is a great project and I'm privileged to be part of it. Great. Well, let's get started. So our first question for you today is what tactics are currently being used to fight ISIS and how effective are those methods? Well, when we, I come from a military background. I was in the military for 35 years. So when you speak of tactics, that has a certain meaning. But let's look at kind of everything that's being done. And I think that there are a number of things. The primary military piece would probably be the air effort against ISIS, as well as supporting and helping to train and supply uh, our allies on the ground, which are the Iraqis and, and the Kurds and so forth. Um, I do think that uh, there are lots of other things being done. The, the FBI, for example, is, is tracking and prosecuting uh, people trying to recruit, uh, ISIS people trying to recruit in the United States. The Treasury Department has a very interesting initiative where they're going after the money flow that ISIS needs. As you know or may know, ISIS is selling a lot of oil and that's one of the ways that they get a lot of their money. So it's a multidisciplinary effort. It's an international effort. Uh, but the question now is what more can we do? Uh, exactly. So going forward, and given the recent attacks in Paris, uh, what do you think the U.S. approach should be to fighting ISIS? Well, I think the first thing we ought to do is unleash our air power. Our air power has been restricted by very constrained rules of engagement. My view is that we, ought to, we have to observe the law of war. But the law of war, it permits uh, not zero, it, the law of war doesn't call for zero casualties, for example. But the law of war says they can't be excessive in relation to the military advantage anticipated. So I think that we, what we ought to do is rather than try to improve upon the law of war with more restricted rules of engagement, we ought to follow the law and that would give us more leeway to conduct airstrikes that can really hurt ISIS. Because we have to remember, every time we forego an airstrike because of concerns about civilian casualties, that's not a no-cost approach because the people on the ground, the ISIS killers, are going to live on to be able to go out and kill other people or make sex slaves or, or do all the, the machinations that we've seen them do. So I think that we ought to follow the law but be much more aggressive. And let me just give you a fact and figure. Uh, during Operation Desert Storm in 1991, we were dropping per day about 6,000 bombs against ISIS per day. As of last July, there was a Council on Foreign Relations report we're only dropping 43. So you can see the level of effort is markedly different. And I think we need to have a much more aggressive and more imaginative way of using that air weapon before we think about other things like American troops on the ground in, in numbers. Great. So then that would answer the next question, which would be, whether or not we should use troops in the future? You know, I, I don't think we can rule it out because this is that serious a, a threat where we would want to use troops if necessary. But I think we have to exhaust all the other possibilities. And I've always believed that in situations like this, the face of the opposition to ISIS ought to be the people who are suffering the most. So that would be the Kurds and the Iraqis and so forth. So on the ground, and they can do that. They might not have the sophisticated air power or the other technologies that we have, but they should be the face of the ground force. So I think before we consider that, uh, beyond you know limited numbers of special forces, as the president has recently done, we ought to robust up our support of the, uh, of the international folks on the ground, and we ought to robust up our our asymmetric advantage, which is our air power and our other technologies, to include our intelligence gathering technologies. We need to make that information available to the Iraqis and Kurds on the ground, as well as uh, uh, Syrian allies as well. Okay, so then given that approach going forward and the recent attacks in Paris and against the plane going over Egypt, do you think that there is a potential for uh, allyship between us and the French and the Russians? 
Well, well, certainly I think uh, we can anticipate a, a close relationship with the French. But you ask a great question about the Russians. I don't see us entering into the kind of formal coalition operation that we might have in, say, with NATO, NATO countries. But I could see, I could envision a more robust coordination of an air effort, for example. There has been some coordination today just for safety of flight, make sure planes, because Russian planes are flying in, in Syria and American planes are flying there, and we literally want to make sure they don't crash into each other. But now uh, there might be, there is an opportunity for further coordination, and I think that would be a good thing. So you also mentioned to me earlier that there was recently a Chinese national killed. Correct. Uh, this is literally something that came out in the last day or two. And, uh, and that invites a whole nother factor, meaning uh, China historically has not been very interventionist anywhere for any reason. But now they have come out saying that they are going to pursue the killers of this Chinese national. Uh, what that will actually mean in practice, it's hard to say. But it's another opportunity that I think that we might have to find common ground against a common enemy. And from my perspective, every time you have that opportunity with, with nations that you might not otherwise have good relationships, if there are things we can agree about, if we have common concerns, let's maximize that, not only to solve the problem, but maybe to set the stage for further peaceful and cooperative relationships. Yeah, and it seems like this is the first time in a long time that we've had a common goal with Russia and China. Yeah, the, the, last, the only other analog that I can think of is the uh, task force against pirates off of the Somali coast. That involved uh, Russian ships, Chinese ships, European ships, American ships, and so forth. And the interesting thing, it was successful. And it, it provides uh, something of a template to show that hey, maybe we can make this work and maybe we can defeat this adversary as the Somali pirates have been largely suppressed because of that joint uh, international effort. So on another, on another note, after the attacks in Paris, ISIS came out with a statement saying that the U.S. is their next target. Do you think this is uh, a likely reality and how is the U.S. going to face this? Well, I was surprised to hear that they said it was their next target. I thought it was always one of their targets. So I think that we live in a world where uh, these kinds of adversaries are going to always be coming after the United States. This is particularly pernicious because they have demonstrated that they can conduct operations in, in France, obviously, with the tragedy of Paris, as well as uh, taking down a Russian aircraft. So they are an international threat. And the United States, surely they, would, they will look for those kinds of opportunities. I think one of the biggest topics related to this then is refugees and uh, whether or not we're going to allow them within certain states. How does this play a role? Well, a couple, a couple things about that. Number one, as a matter of law, the states really can't block refugees from being settled there. That's a federal function and the states really can't block it. What they could do is not ex extend the welcome you know, the, the welcoming hand that uh, you might otherwise expect. So it'd be strictly a, a federal effort. I don't see, with the way the U.S. does the vetting process, the clearing process, it's, I think that the threat of ISIS terrorists, for example, being among these Syrian refugees is, is de minimis. Unfortunately, there's lots of other ways for ISIS terrorists to get to this country. I don't think that they, I would be surprised if any would, would risk the scrutiny that refugees coming to this country are going to undergo before they get here. So I don't see that as, uh, as a particularly great threat. And I think it's unfortunately when something like this happens and, and people, even people in power, don't sit down and really study okay, what is the process? Is it just people, whoever says they're a refugee gets on a plane and, and arrives here? You know, that's not the process. So I think responsible people need to take a look at the process. Can it be improved? If there's ways of improving it, sure. But I, I, would, I, I don't think it's a casual process that will 
particularly facilitate terrorists getting to this country. Great. Well, it was a pleasure to meet with you today, and I hope to see you again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you. Produced by Duke University.